So uh, last time, so I have to start with a small apology. Last time I was actually, now right now I'm in Geneva at CERN. Last week on Friday I was in Paris and it was a bit chaotic because I was trying to give, a, I had to give a seminar there and meet all kinds of people. And so I didn't really have time to work out some details. And so I feel my discussion of the Schwarzschild case was a bit rushed and I didn't uh, provide somewhat uh, crucial um, uh, comments that I want you to know and understand. So I'll go through that uh, again quickly today, but this time with the right formulae, uh, and I hope it will be clearer. And before I do that, I've already <clears throat> pre-drawn this diagram, which is from Hawking and Ellis's book. And what I'll be doing now is basically trying to illustrate uh, this diagram with actual equations. Uh, I do want to always emphasize to students that words are good, pictures are good, but um, at least for me personally, equations are best because you can be sure what's happening. Uh, anyway, the picture is that uh, it's uh, like two plus one. So these two directions are space. You could call them X and Y in a plane and vertical is always time. And we here we have a collapsing as a shell of matter, but in uh, two dimensions, a shell is just a disk. And the disk, this disk of matter is uh, collapsing under its own gravitational force or because we gave it some kind of uh, impetus inwards. And at some point it goes inside its own horizon. And this is the horizon. This is R equals two GM from the center. And once it's inside, it uh, continues to collapse. And here's a drawing of a trapped surface inside. And now this little thing is very important. So this is the light cone. Of course, in 2 plus 1D or 3 plus 1D, it's a connected thing. In 1 plus 1D, it's just two directions. Uh, and what we call out and in are the extreme directions of the light cone relative to the radi radius away from the center of this diagram. So then clearly this ray is out. And so if I'm a photon here, then I can follow that and I get further and further away from the black hole. But if I'm a photon going this way and I follow this ray, then I land across the horizon and I go in. So in and out are clear concepts. However, as we'll now show, on the horizon, the in direction, this one, is still in, but the out direction has become parallel to the horizon, exactly parallel. In fact, the horizon is almost, by definition, that place where the out direction becomes parallel. Remember, these are null directions. Hmm? And that means that a photon that starts life on the horizon just keeps propagating on the horizon. Neither it goes out nor it goes in. And this uh, sets the stage for being inside where we have a trapped surface. And with the trapped surface, we have the light cone here. And you see that this is what would have been the in direction. It's still in. But this is what would have been the out direction. But now, uh, sadly or otherwise, it is also in. And it's also pointing us straight to the center where the singularity lies. Okay. So both these directions are in is the definition of the trapped surface. These are also the corresponding directions at a different point. And the, uh, it's not that these are two separate directions. This is the same cone. You can just continue it in your mind all the way around this circle. And everywhere, it's tilted in such a bad way that both the so-called outgoing and incoming going, ingoing directions uh, that would have been so outside are now both pointing to the singularity and that's the statement of it being trapped. So let's quickly see how to derive all these things and from there we'll be able to proceed to our uh, discussion uh, of more general cases. Now one thing I want to emphasize here and I keep emphasizing it is that uh, it's in a first course in GR, one should learn about the Schwarzschild solution. It's not really a topic for my present discussion at all. Okay. But I'm reviewing it for a very concrete reason. And that reason is that uh, that's how the intuition came. So this solution was found in 1915. And it took till the 1960s for Penrose to basically go beyond uh, just being stuck with this 
one very simple solution. Even the Kerr solution came in the 1960s. So there was a long period with World War and a lot of other stuff happening when there were some papers, but there were very few and progress really picked up in the 60s. And that is what that progress of the 60s is the topic of this lecture series. But still, uh, so Schwarzschild, as you know, is the metric that we write in this way. I explained the reasoning and everything last time. So this dt squared plus same thing inverse dr squared plus r squared d omega squared, uh, which is basically this is made up of the theta and phi directions and doesn't play much of a role in the discussion. Okay, now let's ask in this in this metric, what are the null directions or equivalently, what are the null rays? Uh, and uh, specifically, since we are interested in the radial ones, there could be null rays going in all sorts of directions after all, but uh, radial is our choice. And this says that d theta and d phi are taken to be zero. And then uh, because it's null, d s is taken to be zero. That's what null means. And this implies the equation dt is equal to plus or minus dr upon 1 minus 2gm by r. So there are two null rays, one with the plus sign, one with the minus sign. And they are both orthogonal to the surface given by the sphere given by theta and phi. And this is an example of something I told you several lectures back, which is that uh, there to, to every uh, space-like a surface, uh, if you want uh, to look for an orthogonal null ray, you'll actually find two. And so the space-like surface has to be, in this case, two-dimensional, theta phi, and the other two dimensions are taken up by two null directions and these other directions. And obviously, when you're far away, as r goes to infinity, this reduces to dt equals plus minus dr, which perfectly fits our intuition of what null rays are. One is going uh, dr dt equals one, which is c speed of light, and the other is dr dt equals minus one, also speed of light, but going inwards. Good. So all clear. Okay. Now the problem is that at r equals two gm, the metric breaks down. Now notice that it doesn't break down for R less than 2GM. You can use this metric for R um, uh, less than 2GM, but it's okay for zero less than R less than 2GM as well, as long as these inequalities are strictly maintained. So what's the problem? The real problem is because it breaks down at r equals 2gm, I cannot make any continuous state, uh, statement about an object outside becoming some object inside because I don't know what that object is doing at r equals 2gm. So it breaks continuity. So r less than 2gm, r greater than 2gm are disconnected in the, at least in these coordinates. Uh, when I say at least in these coordinates, of course, it is actually only in these coordinates. But uh, at this stage, we need to be careful not to conclude that we are saying something about space time. We're simply saying we can discuss the outside or we can discuss the inside, but we can't discuss going from the outside to the inside because there is one point in R, which is 2GM, where we have literally no idea what happens. Okay, so if we did draw any conclusions from being at that point, we would be making a serious mistake and we just shouldn't do it. Okay, now, uh, as I told you last time, uh, I think uh, sc uh, scalar curvature, scalar invariants that you can make out of the uh, curvature are all finite at r equals 2 gm. So maybe this is a coordinate problem. This is only a coordinate problem. And then the goal is to find better coordinates. And the better coordinates are given by defining, I'll only define what I need just now, V equals T plus R star, where 
R star is equal to R plus 2GM log R by 2GM minus 1 mod. Okay. Notice that if I didn't put the mod, I could still use it for R greater than 2GM. But since I'm putting the mod, I can use it for R greater than 2GM or R less than 2GM. But I can't use it at R equals 2GM because it's clearly a singular change of variables there. And uh, we also have this interesting... Uh, so the motivation for getting this weird log function is that dr star by dr is 1 over... 1 minus 2 gm by r and it's the above thing is the integral so this one is just uh, this formula is just the integral of this formula and the integral of 1 by x although we often say it's log x it's really log mod x okay if we don't um, uh, if we don't say anything about whether x is positive or negative and notice that there's no mod in this formula that's very important you can verify this fact for yourselves Okay, now with this change of variables, just V, so this makes V into a new coordinate in place of T. It's T we are getting rid of and we are replacing it with V. We are not doing anything to R theta, uh, theta and phi and the metric now becomes now minus 1 minus 2 gm by R dV squared plus 2 dV dr plus R squared d omega squared. Okay. And this metric is perfectly well defined at r greater than 2 gm, r equals 2 gm, and r less than 2 gm. And the way you can see that is that all that happens when we change these values of r is that the sign of this changes but in particular, the dangerous place R equals 2 GM, this vanishes, but that doesn't affect them, doesn't destroy the metric because dVdr is now the term involving both V and R. And it's exactly analogous to du dV in, um, in Minkowski space time where U is and V are T plus and minus R. And we know that there's nothing wrong with that. So if you uh, look at this metric at r equals 2 gm, there's still one time-like and three space-like directions. So the signature is Lorentzian always. That, uh, that's still the case. Therefore, in these coordinates, we are now free to go to these regions continuously from this region. So from the outside now with these coordinates, we can continuously go to r equals 2 gm, and then we can continuously go beyond that. And that's what we'll do now and see what we can conclude. Okay. Is this clear? Wow. You know, it's a big difference being in your own office and giving a talk or being traveling and giving a talk. I feel so much more relaxed today. So I, I hope I'm being clear and I hope I continue to be. So now we find the null rays by the same method. We simply set d theta equals, so again, radial null rays, that's all we really want, d theta equals d phi equals zero, and then setting ds equals zero gives me uh, the obvious uh, solutions. So you just look at uh, this part of the metric, and we are setting it equal to zero. You see that dv is here and dv is here. So it factors out. So one of the solutions is dV equals zero. And the other solution is dV equals twice dr upon one minus two gm by r. Okay. Now, uh, we could still be outside. We haven't yet gone inside or even on the horizon. And if we are outside, we should be able to identify which one is ingoing and which one is outgoing because that was also done in the previous coordinates and it was correct as long as we were outside R equals to GM. So this is the guy that's ingoing and this is the one that's outgoing. And that's very easy to verify. For example, the fact that the first one is ingoing, you can just notice that it corresponds to dt plus dr star equals zero. You can go very far away 
and uh, as r goes to infinity or you can you don't have to go far away and you can just say that uh, see that uh, as uh, r increases so it is remember r is the coordinate not r star r star is just a function as r increases actually the, I, I prefer to say it the other way as t increases r decreases okay to maintain this sum to be constant and well that's what we expect uh, for an ingoing guy and in the same spirit if you calculate this one then you find that uh, as t increases r also increases okay uh, for r greater than 2 gm so all good of course, we could not have possibly got different uh, results by making a harmless change of variables uh, at r greater than 2 gm, which is a well understood region. As I told you once, it even describes the metric outside the earth. So it's hardly going to be a very strange or change in a very strange way if I make a good uh, change of coordinates there. Okay. Now, um, the first, now let's take, uh, now let's continue our. Uh, to less than 2j and see what happens to each of them. So dv equals 0 doesn't change. It's basically an r independent null vector. So it's dv equals 0. It's it's r independent. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, it, I should have said that. It is r independent in the sense that v and r are my two independent coordinates. So dv equals 0, time will change, r will change, but the condition dv equals 0 doesn't depend on r. Okay, So this null vector doesn't depend on r at all as a vector, and so it doesn't change as we go from outside to inside, so it simply continues to be ingoing. Okay, But the other one changes because of a crucial change of sign here. So this is still true, this form of the expression is still true, but this thing underneath has become negative. And so we now can better write it as uh, dt plus dr star equals minus 2dr over 2gm by r minus 1. I've just rewritten the denominator the other way so that it's always positive. And now these are functions, right? So this uh, this equation, you can simply plot. You can just use Mathematica uh, to plot uh, r as a function of t or t as a function of r. I guess r as a function of t is what you want. And you'll easily find that because now this uh, denominator has changed sign, this now becomes ingoing. So both are ingoing. Uh, while only out, outside the uh, this region, one was ingoing, inside the uh, r equals 2 gm, both are ingoing. And exactly then, the sphere is a trapped surface. Theta phi sphere is a trapped surface. Now, if I was organizing this course differently, and probably I would next time I teach it, uh, I would have told you all this right in the beginning, uh, and it would have somewhat demystified what Penrose was doing, because all that I'm saying now was certainly known to Penrose and known much before Penrose got into this business. And his genius was to abstract this property to realize that it's the trapped surface, which is derivable in Schwarzschild, and we've just derived it, uh, to make it abstract and uh, make it a property of generic black holes and not only of the Schwarzschild black hole and follow its consequences. Okay. Now, two more co uh, comments, and then uh, I'm done with the review of Schwarzschild, and then we can talk about uh, a few more general things. Uh, are there any questions up to now? Yeah, Sambit says, yes, it's clear. I'm so glad. Okay. Now, what happens in these coordinates at r going to zero? That's the other weird point of the original. Uh, um, solution in the original coordinates. <clears throat> well, here, if you calculate uh, a particular scalar invariant. The advantage of curvature invariants is that they just don't change under change of coordinate system. 
and this is 1 over r to the sixth as r goes to 0. Uh, unlike the way it behaved at r equals 2 gm, where it just went to a finite value, here it actually diverges. And so there's no change of coordinates that can get rid of this problem. Okay. And so this is a true singularity, r going to 0. And we can still talk about it, but um, we should be careful when we do so because <clears throat> we don't understand really what it means to have a singular geometry. But here, at least, you're entitled to say that there is a singularity in the geometry. As we already saw, uh, it's wise in the general case not to use that word and to say the space time is geodesically incomplete. The same thing is true here. But um, because you can't continue a geodesic all the way to the origin, but um, but singularity is a valid word to use in the context of Schwarzschild. Okay. Now notice that therefore, so this is uh, the analysis of Schwarzschild, and there are two consequences of Schwarzschild geometry, and they seem to have sort of come in a package. One r equals 2 gm is a one-way membrane or event horizon. These mean the same thing. And horizon is what we'll always call it from now on. We are now qualified to call it horizon because we've actually seen that the null vectors inside, which are the trajectories that light would follow, in the future uh, are all pointing inwards as in the diagram I showed you at the beginning. And so light cannot escape from inside. And if light can't escape, it takes a little work, but it's quite straightforward to show that nothing can escape. Okay. Uh, one thing I hope you realize, and if you are going to talk about this subject in the popular sphere or in popular lectures, it may be worth emphasizing. It's not that a black hole is such a powerful object that light which is inside is sort of struggling and running trying to get out but it's just not fast enough to get out or something that's really that's a very simple classical pedestrian sort of way of saying it but it's really not a struggle to get out the struggle is doomed because there is no direction out it's more like you can check out anytime you like but you can never leave okay all directions are in there are no directions out. There are no future directions out. Okay. And uh, of course, there are, once you're outside, there are future directions in. So you can go in because here you have this ingoing null uh, geodesic. And remember, this ingoing one continues to be ingoing on the horizon. It doesn't do anything weird on the horizon. So if you're going, you keep going. Now, there are some discussions of redshift and what an asymptotic observer outside would see if they followed you, but I'm not going to go into those. If I, me, I'm just on a, for some reason, on a speed of light on a photon, sitting on the back of a photon and it's propagating in, it'll just keep going in smoothly. Nothing will happen here. And then uh, I will slowly wake up to the fact that I'm on a closed trapped surface and there's no direction in the future that points out at all. So I'm, I can save myself the trouble of trying to speed up my rocket ship. There just isn't that direction. It's the geometry. And so it's, it's, not, it's not something uh, more simple like a very heavy object that's dragging things. Of course, you can give those interpretations, but it's really geometric. Okay, good. Okay. So we have our one-way membrane and everything I say in the rest of this lecture and in the next lecture will depend on the one-way membrane property, but it will take some time because we haven't even formulated the problem outside the Schwarzschild context. And if we did formulate it for another black hole like Reissner Nordstrom and another one like Kerr Newman, we still wouldn't be done. We want to formulate it for black holes which have no special symmetries and for which we may not know the exact solutions. And right now, we don't even know how to say what that object is. Okay, but let me finish my thought, which is was left halfway. One consequence is the one-way membrane, and the other is r equals zero is a singularity. And notice that they came together. So these, in the Schwarzschild case, they came together. Okay. 
And um, okay, by the way, this event horizon is also what allows us to call this object a black hole. So it seems like a black hole has a horizon and also a singularity, and these are the two defining properties. Okay. Uh, in a moment, we'll ask what's the more general situation. But there's one last thing I need to say before moving on to it, which is the meaning of horizon, the word horizon. So in your mind, if I'm in four dimensions, three plus one, as we all are, uh, what, do I, what do I mean by they came together? They came together means both are properties of the same solution. The one solution had two properties. I don't mean that one property implies the other because I have the solution, right? So whatever, I'm only talking of the Schwarzschild solution. So I'm just saying it's a fact that there are two very weird, unusual, strange behaviors, which are properties of the same one and the same solutions. We haven't defined some bit, you have to be patient. We haven't said what's a black hole. Okay, we spent uh, about six lectures defining causal future, causal past, uh, domains of dependence, Cauchy hypersurfaces, global hyperbolicity. But at no point in those lectures, in those uh, discussions, did we ever say what's a black hole. And I still haven't told you what's the black hole. I've only told you what's the short still black hole because it was the first one. And it's the one that we should use to start getting intuition. But whatever is the black hole better not have any symmetries. And I, I certainly won't know the classical solution. So I'll have to find a cleverer way to define it. So I'm going to define it. Hmm? Okay. So whether they, these come together in the general case is an unknown question. And this is what I'm going to discuss. Okay. Now, before that, I just want to clarify some feature of the horizon. So let me take a vote in the among the people present. Uh, when you think of horizon, is it a 2D thing or is it a 3D thing? 2D or 3D? Two D. Okay. So it's like a sphere. Inside the sphere is the weird stuff. Outside the sphere is normal world. Okay. But that's not the mathematical definition of horizon for a very good reason, because the black hole is a space time. First of all, the black hole need not be time independent. I give you a simple one. But actually, uh, in fact, you can already see it in this diagram. In this diagram, um, as time evolves, here there's no black hole. At the, in these times, there's no black hole at all. After this shell of matter has shrunk below the Schwarzschild radius, which is that, I'm just using it because this is a toy diagram of a Schwarzschild black hole. Now there's a black hole from here onwards. Okay. And this is its horizon. Now, what is this? What is the geometry of this horizon? It has one direction going up, and it also has two two directions, theta and phi in 4D uh, going like this, which are the directions along that shell that collapsed. So it's a three-dimensional object, okay? Of course, I can slice it at a fixed time, and then I'll see a two-dimensional slice. So which one do we call the horizon? Well, the answer is that we uh, um, call either of them the horizon, and we don't always uh, explain clearly. So I'm just going to explain now. So in the 3D sense, uh, and this is the proper mathematical definition. It's just the hypersurface R equals 2 gm in coordinates V, R, theta, phi. And therefore, along the horizon, we have V, theta, and phi. So it's 3D. Okay. But we can also think of it as 2D by saying that take V equals constant, then is just described by theta and phi. Now, the second one and the reason, yeah, in 3 plus 1D space, it will be a 2 plus 1D horizon. But of course, what does it mean physically? It's the 2D horizon and its entire uh, world line, if you like. It, the, vol the, the volume it spe sweeps out as it goes in time. Okay, this is part of the subtlety of understanding space time versus space physics. In space time, time always evolves. So even a point 
a spatial point in in uh, in space time is a line because it's not just the point now it's the point now later 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 all the way to infinity so a point is really represented a spatial point is represented by a vertical line okay a space time point is a point but now it's a place in space as well as a particular choice of time Okay, and uh, remember, we are always working in globally hyperbolic space times. So one way to take V equals constant and to intersect this would be to take a Cauchy hypersurface sigma and just draw it. And it will in general pass right through the black hole. It's just a surface. It's a geometric surface. It's not any person going here or there. So uh, it will intersect and it will intersect in a a uh, spatial section that's how the cauchy hypersurface is built it's remember space like a chronal and that's going to be the 2d thing that we call the horizon is it not like the surface of a sphere spatially absolutely it is but in space time a sphere is not a 2d object it's also the future supposing i have an expanding sphere expanding in time okay so at every time it's a 2d object okay but the space time of that sphere is a 3D object, which is the sphere times a time going to the future. And I have to specify the function, how the sphere is evolving in time. In that sense, it's a 3D object. And it's the same thing I'm saying for the black hole horizon. It's not very remarkable that way, except for one particular fact, which is that the third coordinate is V. And V, uh, remember, has certain strange properties precisely on the horizon okay precisely so uh, let's get to that uh, i don't think i did that but i wanted to do that a minute ago yeah i'm going to do that now okay so i hope this point is clear the horizon is a 3d space time it's also a 2d space at any fixed time that much is clear now let's ask about the null rays at the horizon so we've discussed the null rays outside the horizon, we've discussed them inside the horizon, but we didn't yet discuss them at the horizon. Okay. Now the horizon, so the null rays recall were dv equals uh, zero and dv equals 2dr upon that stuff. Uh, so uh, let me take the outside formulation. So one minus uh 2gm by r okay now this one uh this null ray is um always an null ray it's the same outside it's the same inside so it's the same on the horizon this one however uh, becomes a bit strange because the denominator on the right side goes to zero on the horizon. And so you might think this equation diverges, but there's a simpler way to say it, which is that exactly at uh, r equals one minus two gm, this corresponds to dr equals zero. So the only way that this uh, equation can be finite is if dr goes to zero, exactly proportionally to one minus two gm over r then the ratio will be finite amount of dv or you could have written this whole equation in the first place by taking this to the other side and then taking r to two gm and either way you get dr equals zero so dr equals zero is quite remarkable because it says that uh this uh it says that the radius, uh, so the ray stays on the horizon. So remember the, the horizon was R equals two GM. And you would think that the radial coordinate uh, in a null direction will change. But now we see that in fact, once we are on the horizon, the radial coordinate doesn't change. The null direction that was corresponding to this previously outgoing vector now has become dr equals zero, which is a parallel direction. Now there's really no surprise. It's already in the figure. And I'll simply scroll back to this figure. And what we've just derived is this part, okay? The fact that the null uh, direction now, uh, which was, uh, 
pointing out before and which is pointing in later on is now just hugging the horizon. It's just parallel to the horizon. So this is something important. And from this fact, we learn that um, um, the signature of the horizon as the 2 plus 1D of the, as the 3D space-time is actually not what we might naively have thought, but it's 0 plus plus. Okay. It's interesting because the signature uh, outside is minus plus, plus uh, minus plus plus plus, and inside it's also minus plus plus plus. Even on the horizon, it's minus uh, plus plus plus. Okay, four-dimensional signature. The space-time signature is Lorentzian throughout. But if I restrict to be on the horizon, then obviously I lose one direction, right? And then the signature becomes zero plus plus because the dr equals zero null vector is embedded inside the horizon. And we saw that once, that if I have a null vector that's embedded in a surface, then obviously it's orthogonal to itself because it's null, but also that surface has a signature zero because of that null vector. So it's zero plus plus. So the horizon itself is a null hypersurface. So we've talked, we've defined null hypersurfaces before and finally we found one. And now of course, this should make it clear that when I say this, these words, I mean the 3D, the horizon in the 3D sense. Okay, what use is the horizon in the 2D sense? Well, in the 2D sense, we can simply, uh, okay, so it's a null hypersurface with coordinates V. Uh, okay, let's keep it like that. In the 2D sense, the horizon is uh, just given by theta phi, so it's a sphere. But what is the size of that sphere? Well, we don't know. It depends on the on the geometry and we can calculate it in the Schwarzschild geometry, we find something. And since the Schwarzschild geometry is time independent, that's just the horizon area forever. So in this particular case, the horizon as a 3D space is a boring 2D, uh, 2D sphere with a, a direct product with that null vector, which is parallel to it and which propagates that sphere into the future. That doesn't have to be the case always. However, it's the when we say horizon area, and I'm sure you're expecting us to say that soon because we'll be talking of Hawking's area increase theorem, is the area of the sphere. I hope it's clear from this setup that it's a calculable quantity at any particular time, which means any particular section of the hypersurface. But right now, uh, except in the Schwarzschild case where it's also constant and doesn't depend on where I am uh, going up. In fact, this diagram roughly captures that. Uh, but it doesn't capture the fact that this direction is null, which we just showed. The direction along parallel to the horizon is null. It's not time-like. Other than that, that's what it is. But once we get to more general black holes, we'll be interested in how this horizon area behaves with time. Okay, good. Okay, so this concludes what I have to say about the Schwarzschild black hole. And I'll very briefly uh, remind you of something that I've said very boringly from the beginning over and over again. Rai Chaudhary, Penrose, and Hawking in that time order, maybe other people to whom I'm, uh, who, who I'm not been uh, giving sufficient credit. Sachs, I think, was one more. Their entire philosophy was, we're not going to just take the Schwarzschild solution and make a theory about life and the universe and black holes on it, because it's very special. Who knows whether anything we theorize from the Schwarzschild solution is true in general. And to emphasize for you the impact of that generalization, literally all these all this knowledge that I've given you about the Schwarzschild solution by itself, if it had been nicely encapsulated and made rigorous in the 1960s, would not have given Penrose a Nobel Prize. Because one of the key features in his Nobel Prize was that 
he should be making a prediction applicable to the actual world we live in, should have experimental consequences. And the experimental fact is that the universe is full of black holes. It literally contains millions of black holes. This is how, this is what we deduce today from observations. Okay. And you certainly can't imagine that when the universe evolved, Everything that evolved was a perfect spherical shell and perfectly symmetrically collapsed on itself without any angular momentum. In fact, very likely there are no black holes in the universe that are actually Schwarzschild because it has no angular momentum and everything has angular momentum. The earth has angular momentum. Why shouldn't any black hole have? And LIGO actually has shown, uh, has calculated or estimated from their numerical relativity fit to the data, what is the angular momentum of their rotating black holes that merged and formed a new one. And they found sensible values for that angular momentum, which is quite far from zero. Okay. So generic black holes are not like Schwarzschild. So you have to take all these, all these results. And if you can prove something interesting that happens uh, two black holes which are generic, then you have made a prediction for the universe and then you get basically the Nobel Prize that Penrose got. Okay, So I want to emphasize this because elementary GR introductions very rightly start with this solution, but all too often they also end with this solution. It's like, okay, reissner nordstrom is more complicated, Kerr is more complicated, but it's not only a matter of complication, it's a matter of generality and this is where we are. So now we have to move on to the general situation. And now much of the bag, uh, of, of the toolkit as it were, that we set up uh, over the last uh, many lectures will come in handy. And it was in fact precisely developed by these people, Penrose, Hawking and so on. Okay. Now the problem with the general situation is that we now no longer know what we even mean by a black hole because these are two properties that characterize the black holes we know and are we supposed to assume one of them or both of them which one are we supposed to assume which one is the black hole supposing we had a horizon but no singularity or supposing we had a singularity but no horizon would that be good or bad would that be a black hole or not now the horizon without a singularity, I don't think we know any example, but it's not uh, bad in itself. Mm -hmm. Actually, it might be okay. You could at least go into the black hole with your lab, do your experiments and die happy without having actually been crunched up in the center of the black hole. You could live there the rest of your life, hypothetically. But the singularity is a problem and it becomes a problem because singularities destroy the predictivity of equations. And they don't just destroy the predictivity of a few equations, they destroy the predictivity of physics itself. And this is an essential reason why we still don't understand the interior of the Schwarzschild black hole in the full quantum physics sense, uh, because there's a singularity. And, and so we can make speculations, but we can't really make very precise predictive statements. Okay, but in, in the Schwarzschild case, fortunately, they are hidden by horizon. So physics outside all black holes just goes on as normal, is normal. There's no breakdown of physics equations outside all black holes because whatever are these singularities, they are inside. That's for Schwarzschild. Now, we better assume that this is true for all black holes. And that assumption is called cosmic censorship. This is how it was roughly stated by Penrose. Now there are, one can go into many pages of details about the hypothesis because um, 
there are many forms of it. There's a weak one, a strong one. They also have a subtle relation between them. But uh, as described originally by Penrose or in that spirit, uh, any singularity, we assume any singularity in space-time is hidden from the outside world. We sort of use this word outside world to describe the region far away from gravitating, gravitating objects by a horizon. So this is the hypothesis. Now, if we didn't have this hypothesis, we would not be able to literally say anything. For example, uh, if we tried to say something like, let's look at space-time from the point of view of an observer far in the future, an asymptotic observer who's, uh, who's receiving light signals from here, and from that person's point of view, what is in their causal past. We can't say that without cosmic censorship because they may not be such an observer. We can't simply assume that somewhere there's such an observer because there might have been a singularity in the past of that person. And now no laws of physics anymore apply to the signals that go to that person, the signals which reach the singularity. It's not that it's, it's a little worse than just saying we delete a point and make the space globally, uh, not globally hyperbolic. Those points we can delete or put back. But if, if you have a whole singularity as part of the geometry, is not in your hands. And if that singularity can influence moving particles, then literally the concept of causal future and past just breaks down. Okay. And so for this reason, if once we assume this, then we can neatly divide the outside of a black hole where life is normal and there are no singularities to the inside of a black hole where life may be abnormal. We would like to study it. There are singularities, but we always think from the point of view of an outside observer and we are relatively safe and we can make some statements and even some predictions. Okay. Now this hypothesis is definitely not proven. It may or may not be true. It remains a conjecture. And everything that's going to be done from now on in these lectures and in general assumes it, except for those discussions which actually go into details of which form you assume, what details you assume. And I'm not going into all that. I'm just taking a practical point of view of assuming uh, this, uh, this thing. And so by this assumption, so it's, uh, it's a, a, a conjecture or an assumption, uh, basically says that these two properties which came together in the Schwarzschild solution also come together in all valid space-times. And by the way, there are invalid space-times. For example, reissner nordstrom where the mass is below the charge bound or um, Kerr's solution where, the, again, the mass is below the angular momentum bound. Uh, these have naked singularities and we uh, reject them as being unphysical. So it's not that you can't write them down. Uh, and in those cases, there are some interesting things. For example, I think Hartle argue, argued that if you take a curved black hole, which is spinning, and try to spin it up so that it crosses the angular momentum bound J less than M in some units, then you need to add a particle which is also rotating. But if that particle has angular momentum sufficiently large, it will not, you won't be able to throw it into the black hole. It will kind of fly off. It will be rotating exactly too fast, orbiting too fast to actually go in. So there are physical reasons to think that nature conspires to make this hypothesis true. But there is no proof, so we just make the hypothesis. So notice that it's not there's no symmetry involved in this hypothesis. It's just a statement about topology, that a horizon is outside the singularity or a singularity is inside the horizon. And so we are still going far away from Schwarzschild or any other symmetric solution, but we are retaining this property. Okay. So that's all I have. To Please, sorry. How is the horizon defined exactly? Yeah, so uh, we are going to do that now uh, with this hypothesis. So in some sense, we are going to, uh, so the hypothesis doesn't become precise till now I write down the definition of the black hole and the horizon. Okay, uh, if you like, you can put it another way. 
when I define a black hole just now, you'll see that it has the property of cosmic censorship built into the definition. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can uh, you can state this without using the word horizon by saying that it's causally hidden from the outside. Okay, I'm anticipating that what causally hide causally hidden means that it cannot influence events outside. So yeah, you can use words which don't include horizon. Okay. So now to define a black hole, and this is going to be fun. Uh, we have to do a bit of uh, causal structure of space time all over again. And for that, we are going to assume that there's an observer whose world line is called I. And if you see this world line, it's approximately vertical which means the observer isn't moving too much. So I don't want an observer who's uh, going in a null direction or accelerating very fast or something. The person is free to, so the, but the person is far in the future. Okay. So we start with that. And now we say, and this is a generic observer as far in the future. Okay. Now consider the causal past of this person, J minus of I. We have defined these concepts and G, we've defined J minus of each point and now just take every point on I, then you get the union of those J minuses is J minus of I. Okay. So now this is the uh, set, the subset of the full space time M from where signals can reach I. It doesn't matter where they reach on I, we assume that it's a very long world line. And so they can reach that observer at any time. Uh, it doesn't matter at what time, but they should be able to reach. Okay. Now you realize that J minus in an ordinary space time would basically fill up all of space time because from wherever we are, we send signals to the future. They will intersect this. Uh, we can send signals to the future to intersect this world line. Okay. If we, if we do this over all observers, I or all world lines, I in the far future, we'll certainly generate space time. Okay. But what happens if there's a black hole? Well, the black Black hole region isn't in J minus of I because uh, if it were, it would mean that signals from the black hole can reach this person on this world line I and signals from the black hole actually from inside the black hole can't reach anybody. So it's not inside uh, J minus of I. Okay. So we define a geometric region B equals the full globally hyperbolic space time M minus this backslash is mathematical minus j minus of i. j minus of i is clearly a subset of m. I just remove it, whatever is left is b. Okay, now notice the, how the dimensions are working. Okay, uh, if i is the world line of an observer or even if i is a point, the j minus of a point sweeps out a big set in m. Okay, so that set has the same uh, let's see, that set has the uh, yes, yeah, same dimension as M, and therefore the black hole space time also has the same dimension as M. So it's a four dimensional space time. So it's a four dimensional subset of space time, three plus one, and it's M minus J minus of uh, uh, M slash J minus of I. So the boundary of the black hole then will be the horizon. We can say that uh, right now, we can add this to the definition. H equals D del B is the boundary of, is the uh, horizon. So any set has a boundary, whether it contains its boundary or not, we need to see that it's a question of whether the set is open or closed. So we'll uh, now go into that question. This is the definition of the black hole as well as, uh, as well as its horizon. Yeah. Shikhar has a question. Do we call these solutions care with MDR uh, unphysical based solely on our cosmic censorship hypothesis? So I would say um, no, because I just gave you an argument due to Hartle, which suggests that if you have a curve solution with 
uh, satisfying the angular momentum bound, there's really no way that you can do an experiment to spin it up beyond that bound. So in that case, it's not based on any hypothesis. See, uh, these hypotheses are not needed when we have a solution. These hypotheses are needed when we don't have a solution. Please give me a second. Uh, Uh, okay, then. Yeah, good. So I hope that was clear. We we, we need a uh, hypothesis or conjectures in the general case. And now, as you see, I'm back to topology and geometry without any assumption of what uh, solution I'm looking at is the general definition. Notice, by the way, that if uh, we apply this definition to the real universe, then B is a, a super is a is a is a disconnected set containing every black hole in the universe. Okay, so there's nothing like B is has to be connected. Let's be clear about that also. Okay, now theorem J minus of I is an open set. Uh, this can be proved. Um, either rigorously or uh, intuitively, the rigorous proof is involved. The intuitive proof uh, is in Witten, in Witten's review. And um, basically, the idea is the following. I can give it to you quickly. Uh, supposing I have this is I, then J minus is some kind of like that it's like the past light cone of i and we want to say that it's um it's open because if i have a path from here leading to a point on this world line then i can always find an open neighborhood which uh, also has contains points leading to other points on this world line Okay, and uh, th the fact that every uh, point has an open neighborhood uh, contained in the set is the definition of an open set. So J minus is an open set. I'm not going to go into complete detail about this. You could have lots of questions, but uh, I I'll urge you to take look take a look first at the intuitive proof and then the more rigorous proof. Okay. However, luckily it fits with what we want because now look at uh, B. B being the complement. Of J minus of I. Is therefore closed. The complement of a closed set in topology is by definition the complement of an open set. So we've got that B is closed. This is very good. Uh, hence, H equals del B is a subset of B itself. The closed set contains its own boundary. And this is good. It means that the horizon is not uh, neither here nor there region. It's special, all right, but it's part of the black hole region. Okay, good. Now, uh, the next theorem which I think already starts with, uh, I, I'm not sure if this was originally proved by Penrose, a formal proof is in, in walled. Um, any trapped surface in M, M is the full space time, has to be completely inside B. And uh, B is the black hole, again, viewed as a three-dimensional space-time. And remember, we uh, had this picture for the Schwarzschild case that there was a sort of uh, a trapped surface. There was a horizon, and the trapped surface was inside the horizon, right? With this thing like this and these light cones pointing that way. Okay, but how do we know that we couldn't have had in a not in short shell, but in more general case, 
some weird thing like this, a surface that actually cuts the uh, uh, horizon and still is trapped. Okay. So this would be weird because this would be definitely far away from our intuition because our intuition is that the trapped surface is like a sphere, a spherical shell which has gone beyond the horizon. And this uh, would be uh, suggesting that some weird change of geometry has taken place on a 2D surface, which is partly sticking outside and partly inside. Okay. Now, the uh, basic idea here is that uh, again, there's an intuitive proof given by uh, Witten and a formal proof given by Wald. And again, I'm giving neither. But uh, basically, the idea is that uh, if I had a region of this uh, trapped surface, so this uh, I'll call it S, 2D trapped surface. Mm -hmm. It's always 2D and it's always S for in my notation. If I had a region that was sticking outside, then I would, uh, then this part would be in J minus of I. So I could send signals from this trapped surface to J minus of I, I mean to I, sorry. So, right, this is the horizon. So this part inside the horizon is in B. This part outside the horizon is not in B, therefore it's in J minus of I because space time has split into both. But that means that signals from here can reach the world line I. Okay, so uh, in second case, Second case is this. We're trying to prove it's not possible and all cases are of the type one. Uh, signals from part of S can reach I. But S is a trapped surface. And it's orthogonal future directed null geodesics must focus as per the null right of the equation. Okay, but this is a contradiction because if these geodesics are going to focus here at some finite time then they cannot reach a world line I, which I'm allowed to take as far in the future as I like. I can take my observer very far in the future, okay? And my geodesics are focusing, going to focus before that. And so this is a contradiction, okay? So we just invoke the right Chaudhary equations again, and we get a contradiction. So the contradiction proves this theorem. Any 2D trapped surface in M has to be completely inside the black hole region. It doesn't have any pieces uh, sticking out. Okay, good. Okay, now with all this, we actually can state Penrose's Nobel Prize winning result, uh, which almost was stated uh, last time. But last time we said that if there's a trapped surface, uh, then there will be, uh, uh, then there's a, there's a contradiction uh, that leads to geodesic incompleteness. And we found that contradiction by uh, matching the boundary of the causal future with the Cauchy surface. One is compact, one is non-compact. And so these two don't match and therefore uh, they can't, that can't happen. So it's geodesically incomplete. Okay. But now we've done the additional job of showing that the trapped surface is fully inside. Okay. So uh, what he basically says, and with all this, by the way, you can now open Penrose's paper. Uh, let me give you the, the reference. And uh, I think if my only contribution of these lectures is to make you comfortable to open Penrose's paper, I'm very, very happy. Uh, it's from 1965, Gravitational Collapse and Space-Time Singularities. And um, it is uh, two and a half pages long, including half a page of... Uh, references. So really all you need to do is translate some of the uh, notation there into the notation we are using. 
Okay. So the main result is that, uh, yeah, a trapped surface will form inside a black hole for not just Schwarzschild, but finite perturbations of it. This part is straightforward. The only, I mean, this is obvious because if it can form with Schwarzschild uh, assumption of uh, spherically symmetric collapse, then with a slight variation on that, it won't change the formation of a trapped surface uh, because the trapped surface has two forward going, uh, 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 I mean, two uh, uh, inward going null vectors, and you can't, by a small deformation, flip one of them. Something significant has to happen when you deviate from spherical symmetry before you can flip one of the null vectors to point backward so that you now have a normal untrapped surface. So trapped surfaces are generic, but since trapped surfaces are entirely inside B uh, and uh, using the previous Penrose theorem, which is all, all, all stated in the same paper that space time is. Uh, geodesically incomplete. In the future of a trapped surface. Therefore, black holes form generically. Now, these are not at all his words. He says the following five things are cannot all be true at the same time. This is a, I find particularly cute English way of stating things. Uh, and it takes a little deciphering because you have to go through all the wording to figure out what he's uh, getting at. But it's basically that. And as you can see, the bulk of this we proved much earlier when we proved the Penrose theorem which is that space life space time is geodesically incomplete in the future of a trapped surface that we proved already okay is the only extra thing which uh, which we needed to develop till uh, uh, before stating his main uh, result physics result is that um, on one hand a trapped surface is a generic concept uh, on the other hand, trapped surfaces are entirely inside B. We proved that. It was a really relatively simple topological proof. Uh, and therefore, the fact that space-time into their future uh, is geodesically incomplete or singular means that you have, you have a black hole. So there's uh, so in in a way it's disappointing um, because we didn't all prove it at once. We proved the main result which uses Raichaudhuri equations, null version of Raichaudhuri equations about two or three lectures ago, two lectures ago, I guess. And uh, well, now you see the key outcome is black holes formed generically with generic initial conditions, at least sufficiently generic that you don't need something like exact spherical symmetry or exact axial symmetry to have uh, to form a black hole. Because exact symmetry of initial conditions is highly unphysical, given that universe has temperature and so on. Nothing is going to be exactly symmetric when there are thermal fluctuations. Okay. Now there are some terrific uh, corollaries, and I could do actually uh, both of them in the next fifteen minutes, uh, or I could do maybe one. Uh, the corollaries becomes are so pretty that. Um, that uh, it, it feels really worth. Okay, let's do it, unless there are any questions. I still have 10 minutes. Questions? Okay, good. Um, 
corollary one um okay there are several one is very trivial um if s is in b then the causal future of s the trap surface is also in b this is really almost doesn't need any proof okay the question is could a ray in the future of uh, the set s go out of the black hole region well if it did then from the set s we can propagate to its future and from the future we propagate out so combining those two we propagate ourselves from the trapped surface out which is a co contradiction so it's obvious this is obvious the whole future of a trapped surface is in uh, inside the black hole region okay but now comes a really fun result a single black hole cannot disappear <clears throat> in time nor split into two black holes and let's try to prove this so for this we uh, recall that if there's a we recall the concept of cauchy surface cauchy hypersurface so these are the space like sections of uh, acronal sections of minkowski that are supposed to give us our initial value problem so when we say a single black hole cannot disappear in time nor split into black holes what we'll do is we'll intersect that black hole with a cauchy surface and then we'll um, uh, we'll see what the evolution can be like consistent with the rules that we've derived so here is the cauchy surface sigma and since it intersects the black hole there'll be this region b uh, which actually since we are on the cauchy surface uh, represents uh, the thing which if you remember we were calling uh, the two dimensional black hole i mean it's the, the 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 spatial part of the black hole right because cauchy surface is something at fixed time okay so i'll call this region b intersection sigma in terms of the diagram I had right at the beginning for the Schwarzschild case where the um, black hole is evolving to the future, I just slice it like that. Okay, you th just think of it as a time slice. Okay, now we have uh, to prove this second corollary, we draw a future Cauchy surface. So let this one be in my notation sigma and let this Cauchy surface be sigma prime uh, in future of sigma. You remember that all Cauchy surfaces are deformable to each other and they kind of foliate the space time. So I can do this. Now, supposing a single black hole has disappeared, then I'm in a bit of trouble because now in the second Cauchy surface, which I'm going to put at a time after that black hole has disappeared. So I'm making a contrary hypothesis that black holes can disappear and I'll wait for this black hole to disappear and then draw a Cauchy surface. Now I draw the orthogonal outward null geodesics from here and my question is where do they go okay they have to intersect sigma prime because space time is globally hyperbolic okay but i just argued trivially that if s is in b then its causal future is in the black hole region but there's no black hole region in the future okay so this can't happen Okay, now you could say, well, I cheated a little bit because maybe this was one of my black holes, but maybe there were 20 other black holes in different parts of uh, space time. And these causal rays actually did go into one of those. That's certainly allowed. It better go into one of these black hole regions because of the theorem that it remains in a black hole region. But now we'll simply say that this is B. This is our old black hole B. Maybe it moved. They are free to move. Okay, maybe it went somewhere else, but it's our old black hole. So 
the example in which the whole universe has only one black hole initially and zero black holes finally is a good enough example to show that nothing else can happen. Okay, the same black hole can continue existing, maybe in a different form, maybe somewhere else. But uh, the fact remains that um, uh, there has to be at least uh, the, the black hole that was there has to continue into the future. Now you could say, well, this diagram is a bit, uh, I I've, I've seem to have taken some decision because what about this? What if some of these go here and some of these go into this other one? This is the second problem splitting into two black holes. If it did happen that some of these go into this black hole region and some of these go into that black hole region, then I would have a right to say that this black hole and this black hole were formed by the splitting of this one. So you see how nice these geodesics and Cauchy surfaces are in telling us the traject future trajectory of a black hole. So let's make the diagram a bit less busy and start with one black hole b in and its intersection with sigma and in the future we just assume there are two again we are taking the simple assumption that there's only uh, one black hole in the entire universe to start with and two at the end but it will obviously generalize to a more realistic universe so now our question is if there is splitting then it means that some of these null geodesics go like this and some go like this. Remember, at every step, we are using the theorem that these future directed null geodesics from sigma do not have the option to start here and go here, where here means a region outside all black holes, because that would mean in space, in spatial sense, that this null ray starting inside a black hole has somehow come out. And that's exactly what the horizon is preventing. Okay. This is only for pure classical, no? All this classical. Is only for pure this this this, this cost radiation is entirely is... on classic. Sorry, Hawking radiation doesn't exist. Hawking radiation is a quantum phenomenon. I'm a old retired uh, scientist who still thinks only classical physics is true. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but for this course, it's important to have some discipline not to mix many things. And in this course, everything is classical because Hawking radiation discovery came much later in the mid 70s. And this is really a course on old fashioned 60s physics. So yes, when Hawking radiation comes into the picture, everything changes. Nothing I say is true. And let me emphasize, you who have heard about Hawking radiation from the first, you mean all of you students, you heard about Hawking radiation from the start of your career in physics, never could appreciate what changes it brought into the classical picture of GR, unless you at least follow one course on classical GR, which pretends that Hawking radiation isn't there. Otherwise, what you will learn is a hodgepodge of results. Okay, and that's not how Hawking evolved as a as a scientist. He first learned this, he worked in this, and then he realized that okay, because of this, there are some. Uh, what I'm doing now will lead to the suggestion that black holes have entropy, that they there is thermodynamics, and it is only in that context that he solved a crucial problem. Well, if there's thermodynamics, where on earth is the radiating body? And then he realized that the black hole radiates. So if there were 12 more lectures, that's what I would be talking about. Hmm? But thank you for bringing it up. Nobody should be confused that in this course, we admit the existence of quantum mechanics at all. We simply don't. Hmm? Yeah. Even if we are, so no, no, we are, I'm not going to talk about Hawking radiation. I, you know, it's very, it's very difficult and requires discipline, okay, to stick to these things. Uh, now, how will you prove this result? I'm proving that a black hole doesn't split into two. Okay. See, if it could, then Hawking would never have been led to Hawking radiation. So we are doing something important. Okay. Now, you see from this diagram that if I take any particular geodesic, since it has to go into a black hole region, it either does this or it does that. Okay. However, in this, it, this means that I can take the space of outgoing null geodesics from this region and split it into two parts. The one part which is going there and another part which is going there. Okay. And this contradicts the connectedness of the future light cone of this. It actually says it's disconnected because there's actually two different regions here, which have two different types of null geodesics. Uh, 
If you think of it by a continuity argument, there's a very peculiar point here where the geodesic has to take a discontinuous decision. I'm either going there, which is a black hole in, uh, I don't know, in some, uh, in our galaxy, or no, on second thoughts, I'll just be the first one to go there, which is a black hole in some other part of the galaxy. Okay, so there's a discontinuity, and this discontinuity is not allowed by the topology established by us earlier. Discontinuity of the future light cone of B intersection sigma. This is a contradiction. Okay, so we've proved that two uh, that a black hole cannot split into two this is actually the proof again if you want a more detailed proof with all the um, precise assumptions and the math uh, mathematical definitions uh, it's in vault theorem 12.2.1 and i've list mentioned it in my notes but something that may be bothering you and it's bothered me a lot earlier when i first heard this is that well this is obviously uh, this is this is true we've proved this but let's look at the converse process two black holes merge into one it looks like the topology argument i used to rule out this process here when time reversed will rule out this process and now, of course, we see exactly why not. Everything that's the, the violation of time reversal is coming from the existence of a horizon, which says that there's no problem at all for geodesics from here and from here and not from the black hole at all to, to all go into the future black hole. Completely continuous family. Because what are these ones? These are geodesics which start from outside and go in. You can't, you don't, you can't stop anyone starting in the outside of space time and over time going inside the black hole. Okay. But in this diagram, you don't have those because the corresponding geodesics, which would have made this thing continuous, would be like this. But these geodesics are all starting in a black hole and then they are mysteriously going out, which is what the horizon doesn't allow. Okay, and we've established what a horizon is rigorously as the boundary of the black hole region, which is the complement of J minus of an arbitrary set of future uh, observers. So uh, everything is very clear. This is not allowed, but this is allowed. And in fact, uh, it's not just allowed. It's the thing that LIGO is seeing every day. So LIGO keeps reporting mergers of black holes. And so mergers of black holes are experimentally true. And if our theory didn't allow it, then our theory would have to be wrong. But our theory perfectly well allows it. And it says, well, there's absolutely no problem with continuity of the bundle of geodesics uh, from here uh, going into this uh, single black hole at the end, uh, as long as it includes geodesics coming in from outside. So it, it, it does tell us, and I'm not sure if this has any consequences, that it can't only be geodesics which were already in the inside the original black hole, uh, which uh, entered the final one. And actually, that's also sort of obvious. You have two black holes circulating, and let's say light is shining on these. The moment when they join is a moment when all the stuff around the stuff in this black hole the stuff in this black hole and the stuff that's around them gets all swallowed up by a, another horizon which is the horizon of the new black hole what's a, what's wrong in assuming that the eh sorry what is eh or bh shrinks to zero okay this theorem is wrong if bh shrinks to zero if it shrinks to zero, then where do the outgoing geodesics from the uh, from the black hole region go in the future? Okay, remember this is the immediate. This is a finite distance future. Okay, and they should go somewhere. They can't just disappear, and they can't go out of the black hole. So the problem is the space time diagram might hide for you the fact that if I just drew them going this way, and there was no black hole in the final Cauchy surface, then they would have basically come out of the original black hole and that's what they can't do. They must remain in the black hole region forever. 
So that's why an, uh, a black hole cannot shrink to zero classically. And it's the same reason why uh, roughly why a black hole cannot split into two, because while in this case, we would have to require geodesics to disappear. Uh, in this case, we would have to require uh, geodesics also to be here for continuity. And those would also have to sort of disappear because there's no black hole over here uh, for them to go into. So it's the same reason. It's one theorem. Black hole can neither disappear nor um, split in two, but two black holes can merge. And so this shows us the nature of black holes as objects, which in some sense, they are very special objects. They can combine into similar special objects, but they can't just disappear uh, because what would they leave behind? They had a horizon, they had a singularity. If they just disappear classically, um, we wouldn't be able to understand how space-time, how geodesics evolve in space-time. Now, quantum mechanically, uh, they actually can uh, emit uh, radiation. They can lose mass. By the way, here, they cannot lose mass because there's no nothing coming out of them. So they can never lose mass. Um, so in the quantum mechanical problem, of course, it's an open problem. What happens when a black hole evaporates, though lots of things are known in lots of models. Okay. So this is all I want to say today. And we are Can perfectly... Uh, yes, please. Uh, so uh, the, the black hole, it's anyway geodesically incomplete, right? So uh, can't I just say that all my geodesics end? Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, I think the problem here is that, yes, um, yeah, this is a question that was bothering me this morning, uh, but somehow we actually can't. Um, and the reason has to do with this, the way this is coming out from this intersection. Let me think through this and tell you next time. This is an obvious question to ask. If these geodesics are just allowed to uh, collide and die before that happens, then, um, um, then that's not the case. But here we are actually, it's a, the point is, I think that this is a different surface from the trapped surface. So the, yeah. Let, let me think through this. I'll think through this and I'll also put the answer in the notes once I figure it out or tell you next time. Okay. Um, the last thing that remains to be done is Hawking's area increase theorem. And it almost uh, follows this kind of uh, this kind of logic, but uh, could be done in 10 minutes. But we we'll might as well do it next time for the following reason. Once Hawking found the area increase theorem, that is when Bekenstein started thinking about the meaning of this area increase. Uh, and of course, people connected it to many obvious things. For example, I can obviously throw a mass inside uh, a black hole. And when I do that, its area does increase. Okay, that's not a problem. The uh, theorem was that the area can never decrease. It could stay the same or it can increase, um, but it can never decrease. One way, of course, it could have decreased is if it split off another black hole. And that's just what we ruled out. So it's possible for this to have a smaller area than this, but the total area of this by Hawking's theorem of these two will be greater than or equal to the area of that. So this led to the thought process of, of Bekenstein to think about uh, this as a form of entropy. This then led Hawking and Carter, Bardeen, Carter and Hawking to write some anal analogous laws of black hole thermodynamics. And finally, led to Hawking's understanding of thermal, of Hawking radiation and temperature. And so up to uh, Bardeen Carter Hawking paper is what I'll tell you next time in brief. And we'll stop there. And then someday uh, in the causal future, hopefully of all of us, there will be some other lectures, maybe by someone else on the other stuff. Okay. So uh, in the case of black hole mergers, how does one characterize the movement of singularities? So we remain agnostic about that. So because we believe in cosmic censorship, if there's a singularity here, then, oh, sorry, this isn't the one that doesn't happen. This is the merger. If there's a singularity here and a singularity here, there'll be a singularity here. 
because all three, we just work with the horizons. And, and you see, the advantage of working with the horizons is that we never have to say what's happening inside. If you notice, at no point I ever said what's actually happening inside. Okay. We just talk about the uh, propagation of geodesics. I mean, of course, the geodesics may start inside, but we don't really have to talk about the physics of particles, uh, the fact that they reach the singularity and so on. So we don't bring the singularity into the discussion at all. And that's an extremely convenient uh, fact to get this far. Now, to get further, of course, we have to understand, and ultimately, that is the problem. Say, understanding the singularity would be the key to understanding black holes. Does the first part of the second corollary proves black holes are stable? Yes, class. Yeah, it does. Classically, they're stable. I mean, okay, up to now, I haven't proved that they can't shrink in volume uh, area, right? So they could become very small. That's Hawking's area increase theorem that I'll prove next time. Uh, but uh, it's almost the same discussion. So, um, so yeah, it kind of proves that. Certainly means that if there was a black hole, then there will be a black hole forever, classically. Quantum mechanically, that's far from the case. Okay. We'll stop here. Thank you all. See you on Friday. Yeah. When we consider the disappearing black hole case, the space time itself associated to the trapped surface is vanishing. Yes, I think that's the correct statement. But I would like to just make sure that we are, what are we assuming about the focusing of these geodesics that I've drawn? Um, and uh, part of my problem, which I hopefully is also part of your problem, it's very hard to visualize these things. Okay. So um, the Cauchy surface is three dimensional and B intersection uh, with it is three dimensional. Uh, anyway, let, let me come to it next time. Even in focusing case, the space time isn't vanishing. That's right, Sambit. That's why we believe exactly the space time isn't vanishing. But well, uh, you know, you could say that the space time doesn't vanish, but let's say uh, the black hole vanishes and what's left is some space time, which uh, so you could imagine that the con contrary of this theorem is that this somehow shrinks to a point and this region of space time is in the future of this black hole, but somehow it's uh, not inside the black hole. Right. And that's really the, the, the puzzle that you're trying to understand. I think it's a matter of in, an, analyzing the space-time dimensions a bit more carefully, and I, I'd rather think about it and tell you next time. But uh, in the meanwhile, I'd certainly urge you all to look at Wald's uh, proofs and uh, actually Witten's proofs, which are more, uh, more physical and intuitive. Mine are even more uh, intuitive, at least today, compared, or even more vague compared to his. But um, look at it anyway and think about it and we'll, we'll meet on Friday. So I'll leave now. Thanks.